Before we begin discussing the role classification system, I think it's helpful to step back and understand Boulder's angle and the critical angle of Gassan. Boulder's angle is formed by two lines. The first line begins at the most superior aspect of the calcaneal tuberosity and then goes to the most superior aspect of the posterior subtalar facet. The second line begins at the most superior aspect of the posterior subtalar facet and goes to the most superior aspect of the anterior process. And normally, this should be between 20 and 40 degrees. And during a calcaneal fracture, this can decrease or even reverse. One thing to keep in mind is that just because there has been subtalar joint depression or reversal, that does not mean the subtalar joint itself has been injured. I mean, you could still have an extra articular fracture with a disruption in Bowler's angle. The next angle we want to talk about is a critical angle of Gassan. And this one is formed by two lines. The first line begins at the most superior aspect of the posterior subtalar facet and goes right along the lateral border. And the second line runs along the lateral border of the anterior process. Normally, this should be between 120 and 140 degrees, and disruption of this angle means a subtalar joint has been affected, so you have an intra-articular fracture. Now, I say disruption because depending on what textbook you read, some orthopedic textbooks will say that during the fracture, this angle will increase. Others will say this angle will decrease, but regardless of what you read, the basic idea to take home is that if there is disruption of this angle, the critical angle of Gassan, that means you have an intra-articular fracture. And again, just because you have a decrease or reversal of Bowler's angle does not necessarily mean that you have an intra-articular subtalar joint fracture. Row 1A can affect either the medial or the lateral plantar tuberosity. If the feet are inverted during the time of injury, then the lateral plantar tuberosity is fractured. If the feet are everted during the time of injury, then the medial plantar tuberosity is fractured. And these fractures are often non-displaced. Row 1B is a separation of the sustentaculum teli from the calcaneus. The foot is inverted during the time of injury. An isolated row 1B is not very common because a subtalar joint will be either depressed or injured or both. Now, when you guys take surgery, you're going to learn about this concept of the sustentaculum tali as being the constant fragment. And the reason a sustentaculum tali is constant is because it's held very tightly in place by a number of tendons and ligaments. Tendons such as FHL, FDL and tibialis posterior, and ligaments such as the spring ligament and part of the deltoid complex. Now during the calcaneal fracture, the sustentaculum tali itself does not move very much. Rather, it's better to think that the calcaneus moves away from it. So when you're doing surgery, your frame of reference for all your fixation is actually the sustentaculum tali, and that's why it's called the constant fragment. Row 1C is a fracture of the anterior process. There are two types, avulsion and compressive. Avulsion occurs when the foot is supinated and is due to pull of the bifurcate ligament or the extensor digitorum brevis muscle belly. And these are more common in females, especially when they wear high heels. On an x-ray, this might look like an os calcaneum secundum, but keep in mind that fracture lines are often very jagged and accessory obstacles have very smooth edges. And the compressive type occurs when the foot is pronated. Row 2A is a fracture of the most posterior and superior surface of the calcaneus. It is often referred to as a beak fracture. The patient will land on his or her heel with the knee extended and the foot dorsiflexed. Row 2B is an avulsion fracture of the entire insertion of the Achilles, so you have a complete dislocation. The mechanism of injury is the same as 2A. These can be intra-articular, so you order a CT to rule out subtalar joint injury. 
The patients are often older and have diabetes and osteoporosis. Rule 3A is a simple fracture in the body. The primary fracture line will be different depending on the mechanism of injury. The subtalar joint is not involved. Rule 3B is simply an extraarticular comminuted body fracture. Rule 4A is a simple intraarticular fracture, so measuring the critical angle of Gasson may be helpful. Rule 4B is a comminuted intraarticular fracture. Rule 5A is a comminuted intraarticular fracture with subtalar joint depression, so you will see a decrease in Bowler's angle. Rule 5B is the same as 5A, except this time you also have the calcaneal cuboid joint injured, and that completes the rule classification. Also, you should be able to differentiate between an intraarticular fracture and a surgical fusion post-op. What happened was during our second quiz, they put up a lateral radiograph of the foot, and I saw in the calcaneus what appeared to me to be common your fracture lines. There was some disruption of the subtalar joint, or at least I thought it was a disruption, and the calcaneal cuboid joint. So immediately, me and most of my classmates, we all thought it was a row 5B calcaneal fracture, a very easy point. But it turns out, our professor said, if you look closely, that it's not a fracture between the calcaneus and the cuboid, or the calcaneus and the talus, it was actually just a very smooth line between the two, between the three bones. And then he said, it's a triple arthrodesis post-op with the hardware removed. So in a fusion, what you'll see, if it's done correctly, like if you see a subtalar joint fusion, ankle joint, lapidus, whatever, there should be a very smooth line between the bones, kind of like this. Whereas during fractures, kind of like accessory ossicles, I mean not accessory ossicles, kind of like an avulsion fracture, what you'll see is like these jagged edges. And sometimes it's very subtle to be able to tell the difference, but this is something that can easily come up on your quiz and exam, and I got it wrong, and I don't want you guys to get it wrong. And it can also come up on interviews, because during an interview, they could put up any random x-ray and just ask you to interpret it. And by the end of your fourth year, I don't think any of us should be able to get that one wrong, knowing a fusion versus an intraarticular fracture. Now just some final remarks regarding the role classification. There are others, such as the SX for Presti, and for CTs, we use the Sanders. Now clinically speaking, this is only good for types 1 and 2, because those are extra-articular. When it comes to intra-articular fractures, and comminuted body fractures, or even simple body fractures, the role classification is not very helpful. Whereas the Essex, the Presti, and the Sanders would divide the calcaneal, the calcaneal body into regions and explain what's going on piece by piece. So that's much more helpful for surgical planning.